And then you eventually married Tina, who was extremely light-skinned. Exactly. So, you know, I began dating either all white or extremely light complexion black women. That was my MO. Um, you know, that was my MO. Okay. And Tina's Creole, I guess? Yes. Yes. Okay. She's Creole, but when her family literally, uh, her great grandparents are white Frenchmen that live right outside of Paris. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. And then her. Because Beyonce is her maiden name. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So you end up, based on the history and everything you've been taught and so forth, and everything you've been exposed to, you go and consciously or unconsciously marry someone much lighter, much lighter than yourself. Exactly. Okay. Th- that's exactly right. Okay. Did you start thinking about it at that point or not really? Not really. I mean, when I saw Tina, I, I met her at a party. Uh, and, you know, you see somebody at a party and you think they're white. But I consciously thought she was white. I have to say, once I met her, it was very clear that she was uh, a, a very conscious black woman, uh, and, and uh, really uh, her blackness was inside and out, and as well as her beauty. Okay. Then you go and have kids with her. Mm-hmm. You go and have uh, Beyonce and Solange. Yes. And then Kelly comes in the picture. She's like a kid to us because she lived with us um, 10 years old, 11 years old, um, up until her adulthood. Okay. What was the story? How did she come into the family? Well, uh, there was this group called Girls Time that uh, went on to go to Star Search, and they lost. And then I got involved after that. Before that, I I wasn't involved. Uh, And once we got involved, uh, her mother was a nanny, and they lived in a white home. They actually lived in a white home, two doctors. And one day her mother came home and uh, they sat her down and told her they were getting a divorce and that literally they had to move out in two weeks. And her mother wasn't prepared for that and asked if we would keep Kelly because Kelly was really committed to this this girl group. And her mother needed to go back to Atlanta to just get herself together. And so we committed to keep Kelly for a month that turned into like eight years or Mm -hmm. ten years or something. Okay. Yeah. So you go and form Destiny's Child. Mm-hmm. Originally, there were there were different members. Yes. So uh, originally, it was it was Beyonce, uh, Latavia, and Latoya. Latavia. Latavia. And, sorry. And Latoya. Yeah. Yeah. And Latoya. Kelly. And Kelly. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. The group forms. Why did Latavia and Latoya end up leaving the group? Uh, That's a story I'm not going to tell now. You have to write me a check for that one. Okay. (laughs) Good try, though. Okay. Well, we interviewed Farah at one point. Who? (laughs) Who? Farah. Who? Who is that? (laughs) No idea who that is. Okay. Yeah. Well, she she talked about This was on, I guess, TRL. And Beyonce was speaking, you know, about, about the situation. So she says... We have to say that Pharaoh was not kicked out of Destiny's Child. She actually did not show up for three major promotional events. One which was MTV All Access, she walked out on that, and the Cube Summer Jam, another one in Seattle. You'll see all that on the All Access show. We also had a five day promotional tour in Australia, which was our first visit there, very important. She didn't come. We all agreed that Farah and Destiny's Child should part ways. We wish her the best in the future. But it wasn't a management decision, it was a group decision. We all feel that no personal problems it can be resolved or worth disappointing your fans. Yeah, well, that's not true. I've never missed a show, ever, or I would have got kicked out the group. <laughs> you know how much I was getting paid to do a show, and that's the best part of my day? I'm not missing any shows. But when I leave the group, they weren't honest with people and said that I left. They were trying to give themselves more time to clear the air or whatever, but I've never missed a show, ever. And like I said, if I would have missed the group, then they would have kicked me out. Again, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that in in, uh, in the next book. Okay. Uh, and, and I don't want to give that away today. Okay, fair enough. So you go and put this group together. You talked about there's a certain level of racism in the radio industry. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You must have read the book. 
Thank you, because it's been very, very frustrating in interviews that I was misquoted. That uh, So I, I, I can tell when someone's read the book because their interview is different. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. So talk about the, the racism. From, uh, from a music perspective? Yeah. Well, I talked about it from several. Um, one was discrimination, more, and then I'll talk about the, the racism part. Discrimination was when I got in the music industry in the 90s and I came from corporate America, uh, where we fought discrimination, uh, to go into an industry where you had a black department or urban department, a black music department or urban department, uh, was foreign because I fought so hard at Xerox and to not have that. Yeah. And so um, I realized in order to be successful, uh, you have to sell to everyone. Uh, you can't segment a marketplace. You can, but if you're going to sell to 40 million people or if you're going to want to sell to 340 million people, that's a decision one should make. Uh, but that was part of it. And because when I got to, to Sony as a manager and executive, I was asked to manage an all-girl group that was white, uh, an all-boy group that was white. So I know this for a fact, that their budgets were different, uh, their recording budgets were different, their marketing budgets were different, their advances were different than those in the urban division. Uh, and so that was a discriminatory part of the industry that I witnessed. Uh, the racist part of the business that I looked that still exists today. In some context, I've taught at Texas Southern for eight years, Texas Southern University in Houston. And I teach uh, entertainment recording management is a degree that you get. So one of my artist management class, uh, I challenged him to do some research about three years ago. And the research was to go back 15 years. And, and from a colorism perspective, show me at pop radio the number of black women that were of high complexion and the number of black women that were of dark complexion that got airplay. And again, this is from a research perspective. I've since learned that the common uh, public don't understand the difference of research versus emotional. So the comments I made on the book about race, ra racism is really based on factual data. And when you look back at the charts at Top 40 Radio, you'll see that the, the black women that have been uh, successful with airplay were all of light complexion. Right, because you had mentioned Mariah Carey, Rihanna, mm -hmm. Nikki. Nicki Minaj, and your kids. And Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys and Beyonce and Solange. But it says others in the book. but Right. Um, are all light-skinned and they all get pushed. Correct. And you being in the music industry, you yeah. know that's valid. Well, let me think. Lauren Hill is fairly dark skinned. Yeah, there's exceptions, yeah. Yeah, Lauren Hill. Yeah, there's always She hasn't exceptions. been around in a while. Yeah. What are the other exceptions? Again, we said 15 years, so. Yeah, she, she was out. She was excluded. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to think who, who are the other. Yeah, I think. You can't, you can't really think <laughs> of it. You think of it? No? Yeah, I can't. And, and, and those of us that understand the industry, and you, you know, we you understand exactly what I'm saying. I mean, Whitney Houston was fairly light skinned, but this is. Again, yeah, Whitney falls again in the light In the light skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. I'll tell you why, because Clive, that was one of his things. He airbrushed and made her photos. You know, lighting can do a lot also. Right. Uh, Mary J. Blige was fairly no, brown skin. No, no. Yeah, Mary is down. She did one album, remember the one with the butterflies, the video? I can't remember. Uh, and it didn't do that well. It didn't get airplay at top 40. This I know for a fact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really looking through the list here. I mean, Aaliyah, of course, very light-skinned. Yeah. Um, yeah, I never really thought about it before, but... Well, and again, that's you know part of why I wrote the book Racism from the Eyes of a Child is to get people thinking and dialogue and conversation. Does this apply to men as well? Because you see dark-skinned men... Our, our research and focus were on women. Okay, so you just didn't. Uh, yeah, I, for example, I, Kendrick is at the top of the yeah, charts we, these days. We, we didn't do we didn't do men. Okay, uh, men are, are some work some uh, what exemplified also uh, when we look at the hip hop rap in industry. Uh, it becomes, but when you look at the rap industry, who gets more airplay than anybody is who? 
White people? No, Drake. Drake. In top 40. Ah, right, yeah. Yeah, top 40. Again, I'm talking top 40 radio. Yeah. Yeah, although Lil Wayne had his run. Took him a while. Took him a while. Took him a while to cross over. It didn't take Drake a while to cross over. Yep. Drake almost came out of the box, crossed over. 